Okay, so today we start, we start with the Banu Kiran uh, uh, Sandipudi from ICTS telling us about the formations of monoidal categories. I thank the organizers for this opportunity to speak here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about deformations of monoidal categories. And this is part of a project that I've been working on with my advisor, Pranav Pandit. To begin with, I'll recall some aspects of deformation theory, which will be useful for us. So if k is a field of characteristic 0 and g is a dg Lie algebra over k, then a Morakata element in g is defined to be a solution to the equation you see on the screen. It is known that deformations of objects living over k are associated to Morakata elements in dg Lie algebras over k. Let me illustrate this in an example of A-infinity algebras. So an A-infinity algebra is the data of a graded vector space V. Sorry. Uh, vector space V along with a bunch of maps MNs from V tensor N to V of degree 2 minus N such that uh, this, these bunch of equations are satisfied which uh, basically encode the homotopy coherent associativity of the multiplication. Now in case M0 is not 0, so notice that here I said N is greater than or equal to 1, but if we take N to be going from 0 onwards, then the M0 term is called the curvature and such algebras where M0 is non-zero are called curved infinity algebras. So these are uh, not so nice objects, meaning there's no good notion of a quasi-isomorphism of curved infinity algebras. And there are certain caveats involved in defining a non-trivial theory of such algebras. So for these reasons, uh, we would like to restrict ourselves to uncurved infinity algebras, meaning M0 term we assume to be zero. Now, a deformation of this structure is a perturbation of the multiplication. So, a first-order deformation is a first-order perturbation, mn prime of mn. So, mn prime is mn plus eta n times t, where t square is zero, because we're looking at first-order perturbations. And we impose the infinity relations on mn prime and conclude that eta is a Marakata element in the shifted Hochschild complex of V. So, this is the association between deformations and uh, Marakata elements. Uh, the problem comes from this observation that uh, Morakata elements may induce curvature, meaning even if we start with an uncurved infinity algebra, meaning M0 is 0, one cannot always guarantee that Mn0, Mn, M prime 0 is also 0 all the time. So for this reason, we say that deformations are not the same as Morakata elements. So there's an obstruction to describing deformations in terms of Morakata elements, uh, which is basically the uh, presence of this curvature. Uh, so that will be kind of the main point of the talk. Uh, that's what we want to address. Uh, let me reinterpret Morakata elements uh, in a different way, which will be useful for us later on. So if A is an augmented commutative DG algebra and MA is the augmentation Sorry. ideals. Uh, Sorry. Is, is this happening because the, you decided not to include uh, n equal to zero in the, or n equal to minus one in the Hochschild cohomology? Yeah. Uh, in the, in the previous slide, sorry. Yeah, there's no m equal to my previous slide. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. we don't have m equal to minus one. So here there is an m equal to zero time to write. Yeah, uh, we don't want m equal to zero. That why? gives us curved, curved infinity algebras, and we don't want to. Absolutely, but yeah. Why do you say it, is, it doesn't the Morakata equation includes the fact that there is no curvature? So deformations for us don't have curvature. We want to stay with uncurved objects. So deformations yes. are defined to not be curved. I think that Morakatonic, so I'm saying in the, in the shift to com or or shift complex, do you include the m equal to zero part? Yeah, yeah that is a full complex. So in, in for, uh, a priori, it will have m, m zero terms. So yeah. wouldn't the Morakatan equation does imply, wouldn't the Morakatan equation imply that there is no curvature? No, no, uh, I, I don't think I, uh, Maybe we can keep this for after the talk and then move on since we have very limited time. So, yeah. Uh, let me continue. Yeah, so uh, A is an augmented commutative DG algebra and MA is the augmentation ideal, meaning it's in the kernel of the map from A to K. G is a DG Lie algebra and C star G is the Chevalier Allenberg complex. Uh, this is the complex which computes the, Hoch uh, the Lie algebra homology of G. Then Morakata elements in G tensor MA are the same as maps of augmented commutative DG algebras from C star G to A, which by adjunction is the same as maps, maps of DG Lie algebras from DA to G, where DA is the commutative Kozul dual of A. Uh, it's the tangent 
relative tangent complex uh, of A. Right. So let me focus on the objects of interest, which are monoidal categories. So in the context of topological field theory, line operators and point operators in TFTs form a category. And fusion of line operators gives us the, a monoidal structure on these categories. So the first diagram shows composition, which is the fusion of point operators along the lines. And then tensor structure is coming from fusing line operators. And the compatibility is giving us uh, the functoriality of the monoidal structure. In higher theories, of, so these diagrams are drawn in two dimensions, but in theories of higher dimensions, we can uh, uh, take these line operators ar around each other and then fuse them. That gives us a braided monoidal structure, or more generally, an EN monoidal structure. So this kind of nudges us to go to the world of non-commutative geometry to study this problem, and that's what we do. So we go to the world of non-commutative geometry, where we replace commutative DG algebras with EN algebras. And Morakata elements, so these are now known to us to be Morakata elements. These are replaced by certain generalizations of Morakata elements. So let me say uh, what, what that generalization is in the context of this uh, talk. So if C is a monoidal Kielinia category, one can talk about uh, the monoidal center of C. It's the endomorphism object. It comes from the, looking at endomorphisms of C viewed as a bimodule over itself. So, and then we have this object here, which is the generalization of the Morakata elements. Uh, and D3 is the E3 causal dual, a generalization of the commutative causal dual. So let me say what this generalization is. So a, a map from D3A into the center of C, Z of C, is the same as an action of D3A on C, because the center of C is the endomorphism object. And giving a map into the endomorphism object is the same as giving an action. And this formula is, uh, computes the E3 causal dual. So as a, yeah. as a broad principle, uh, we say that a deformation of an object induces a realization of a generalized symmetry of that object uh, based on this argument. So the setup, if C is a monoidal Killinia category, we define def C to be the space of deformations of C, act C to be the space of causal dual actions, which is given by that, the formula we saw in the previous slide. And we construct a functor, uh, goes from def C to act C. So appealing to the example of infinity algebras, def C is thought of as the space of M primes, ax C is thought of as space of etas, and theta will take an M prime and associate to it the corresponding eta. And this map is in general not an equivalence. But over formal power series, if we only consider formal deformations, and we take C to be the equivalent to the category of uh, modules over an E2 algebra, such that the E2 algebra is uh, homologically bounded below, that is this condition, then one can show that Deformations of C are equivalent to uh, these actions via the, of the causal dual of the former power series. We can rephrase it by saying Morakata elements are equivalent to deformations of C over the formal power series. We say the curvature is gauged away. This is an extension of a similar result by Blanka, Zerkov, and Pandit for Killina categories and Lowen, Vandenberg for A infinity categories. So, in conclusion, if, just to re, uh, re, uh, summarize, uh, if C is a Killina. Uh, monoidal Kielinia category, Morakata elements correspond to curved deformations in general, but if C satisfies a suitable hypothesis, then formal deformations of C are equivalent to Morakata elements. Thank you. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yes, please. Yeah. Often, if you have a deformation problem, then the fact that somehow uh, all deformations are good it has to do with the vanishing of some obstruction somewhere. And uh, so can you phrase this condition? So you had some hypothesis under which all deformations somehow were good. Right. Can you phrase that hypothesis in terms of some place where an obstruction lives and the vanishing of that obstruction? So here, there was a compact generator. Uh, the C was viewed as a module category over some E2 algebra. And in uh, the obstruction would be to the obstruction of this compact generator to deform along with the category. And if, if that obstruction vanishes, the generator deforms, and then we say the category also deforms with it. But uh, yeah, so this hypothesis kind of guarantees that we can all, the uh, generator always deforms. OK. I think we need to move on. So let's thank the speaker again.
Okay, so we now have uh, Johanna Coman from KIPMU telling us about the VOAs from topology, number theory, and SQFTs. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So, as uh, Boris said, what I want to tell you today... Closer to the mic. Ah. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to talk today. As uh, Boris mentioned, what I want to uh, discuss are some new results concerning vertex operator algebras, but coming from the perspective of three-dimensional topology, number theory, and 3D SQFTs. Now, a motivation here comes from the ubiquity of VOAs, which appear as uh, related algebraic structures in each of these three contexts. The VOAs, they formalize mathematically the idea of having operators inserted at points on a Riemann surface, and which get multiplied via operator product expansions where they are collided. So in this way, they describe, for example, the chiral half of two-dimensional uh, conformal field theories, the underlying algebraic structure. Uh, now, um, in terms of their definition, they were introduced already in the mid-1980s, and the definition uh, involves um, a, uh, a set of defining data, which contains a, a vector space, and a set of axioms that this data satisfies. And with um, vertex operator algebras having been around now for almost 40 years and with research uh, related to them evolving for such a long time, by now there exist numerous connections to other areas of mathematics, notably geometry, topology, and as mentioned in the title, number theory. Now connections to supersymmetric quantum field theories, these emerge from various uh, correspondences, whether they are uh, 2D, 3D, 2D, 4D, where the VOAs and their modules or representation categories appear as meaningful invariants for the quantum field theories in uh, um, uh, higher dimensions. Um, for instance, the VOAs can appear embedded into the physical space of the higher dimensional QFT, where they capture distinguished algebras of local operators on some surface. And now here, canonical examples when one discusses VOAs are the affine vertex operator algebras associated to uh, a simple Lie algebra and an invariant bilinear form, and which are strongly and freely generated by a set of fields uh, which correspond to the elements in a basis of the underlying Lie algebra that one started with. And from these uh, affine VOAs, other examples can be uh, constructed, defined, by certain standard uh, procedures, such as constructing extensions or taking cohomologies. So for instance, um, affine W algebras, these uh, can be defined for a uh, simple Lie algebra G and uh, an important element in this uh, Lie algebra from the cohomology with respect to a certain corresponding nilpotent operator um, on a complex which is constructed from the universal affine vertex operator algebra, and a corresponding fermionic ghost counterpart. And then secondly, the example of logarithmic W algebras, which have been defined as the intersection kernel of uh, certain uh, screening operators um, on a lattice VOA, so they are defined by restrictions from lattice vertex operator algebras, and they have been shown to be extensions of the affine W algebras that I just mentioned. Now what I want that what I would like you to take away uh, from these 10 minutes as uh, the punchline is how uh, such uh, algebraic structures uh, have appeared recently in two particular contexts in relation to 3D topology and 3D supersymmetric quantum field theories, and what are some of the implications here. Now the first case that I want to discuss, here the vertex operator algebras, they appear inside a wider network of relations that connect from a physical point of view, a certain uh, type of 3D, 2D coupled systems, so these are three-dimensional n equal to two supersymmetric quantum field theories with a boundary, which are related via a 3D, 3D correspondence to some auxiliary three-dimensional manifolds. They are related to uh, vertex operator algebras, and then uh, there is another box that says number theory, and this is because one of the objects that gets identified in each of these three contexts are a certain type of uh, Q-series. So these are formal power series expansions in uh, parameter Q, which have intriguing number theory properties, and which have different interpretations depending on the context uh, where one discusses them. From the point, the physical point of view, they represent a half index, but from the point of view of the auxiliary tree manifold, they are, um, 
uh, topological invariant. And these get identified with characters of a logarithmic buttress operator algebra. So here the easiest point to start with is from 3D topology because these uh, invariants, they are defined for a certain class of uh, three-dimensional uh, manifolds, which can be constructed by dense surgery on framed connected links inside of a tree sphere, uh, where the surgery data is equivalently captured by a planar graph that has decorations. And then the invariants were specified uh, in terms of this surgery data, uh, the choice of a Lie algebra, and potentially also including line defects on the links inside of the tree sphere, they are. Uh, the invariants were specified by a contour integral. Now, this provides a precise um, algorithm for computing these invariants with the, the caveat that it uh, has a restriction on the type of manifolds for which it is applicable. And this is in order for the Q series that are generated to be convergent inside of the unit disk. But now, assuming that the disk constraint is satisfied, for a certain type of manifolds, these invariants have been shown to be uh, in the span of linear combinations of false data functions. And the false data functions, they have um, um, uh, index, which is only determined by the data of the tree manifold. Now, the caveat that I mentioned is very important because changing the orientation of the manifold uh, poses a problem because it leads to divergent Q series. And uh, uh, formally, this mean, this is equivalent to changing the sign of the parameter tau going to the other side. So this gives rise to the subtle problem of finding these invariants on the other side, and various approaches have been attempted in literature. And now the uh, proposal that I have developed with my collaborators relies crucially on the quantum modular structure of these invariants. And uh, there are three key steps here. The first is uh, proving the uh, precise quantum modular structure of the invariants which are vector-valued quantum modular forms. And then the requirement for going to the other side is precisely that pairs of invariants should have compatible modular structures in, uh, as they approach the rational line. And in this way, we were able to define the mock defect invariants as regularized indefinite data functions, where the crucial point is to uh, determine the regularization data. And from this, we were able to uh, construct the corresponding VOAs. Now, Okay, still, we heard, you heard about yesterday in Masahito's talk. But you had to learn another minute if you want to spend a, a oh. minute. Oh, well. There was one minute left. So oh, perfect. <laughs> All right, well then, uh, in that case. Okay, still, what uh, the punchline is that um, in case one, the identification of these vertex operator algebras, um, it was technically complicated, but it still relied only on, uh, on functions, on Q-series. A uh, more fundamental relation will be at the level of the underlying verte um, vector spaces. And this is what we heard about yesterday in, uh, yesterday morning in Masahito's talk, because in the case, uh, notably, of three-dimensional n equal to four non-abelian fever gauge theories, a topological twist allows to identify a vertex operator algebra on the boundary uh, by kernelizing an underlying uh, uh, classical geometry. So here, by looking at um, sheaves of h paradic vertex uh, operator algebras, the global sections define the VOAs concretely, and this opens the door to many um, exciting generalizations, drawing parallels between the two cases. Thank you very much, and sorry for <laughs> cutting a little bit too early. Perhaps you said already, and I missed it, but what class of three manifolds do you consider? Um, in which case? Uh, case one or case two? Uh, I better not answer that. Tell me what classes of three manifolds okay, so you in, consider. In, in case one, the, the story is a bit intricate. Be, oh, sorry. Um, um, it's a little bit, in case one, the story is a bit intricate because from the physical point of view, the background of the physical theories is just uh, the cigar background. Then, from the point of view of topology, the auxiliary manifolds, they, uh, the ones that we considered are certain cipher vibrations over the tree sphere. But they have a plumbing description in general. So that's case one. And in case one, um, it, the easier point to start with is from 3D topology, because there, the corresponding supersymmetric quantum field theories, uh, in general, are not known to have a Lagrangian description. So it's easier to start from quantum invariance. 
and hence yes, this is quantum modular forms. In case two, the background, the uh, three-dimensional manifold considered, is really the physical space-time background. And in general, that should just have a transverse solomorphic foliation. For us, we only considered effectively um, a complex surface with a half line. So could you consider a general three-manifold fiber over a circle? Which notation suggested, I thought? Uh, in in which, which of the two cases? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. Do you have any uh, case where that's the class of manifolds you consider? Um, yes, in, in case one, that is exactly uh, one of the types of manifolds that can be considered. Vibration over a circle? Oh, uh, well, circle, circle vibrations. No, yes. no, I'm asking the opposite. A vibration over a circle. I need to think about it. Thank you. In view of time, I think we have to move on. So let's thank again uh, Johanna. Thank Great you. talk. Okay, so now we have uh, Sebjörg Jeon from uh, CERN telling us about mirror operators and membrane intersections. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for, uh, for the chance to speak. Uh, this is about a upcoming paper with Nathan, Nathan Housie in a work in progress. I'll explain why mirror operators and R matrix. So let me recap the mirror transformations for W algebra. So the mirror operator is this former differential operators combined with a uh, uh, affine GeO1 current. So to get the um, generating currents of the W algebra, you take a product of them and copy some of them and just um, uh, uh, consecutive products of them. Uh, so it reminds you, it should remind you that product R matrix is under some, some co-product co operations, assuming there's an underlying quantum algebra. And there's another clue, uh, the model of the R matrix. So the previous mirror transformations shouldn't depend on the ordering of the, any of the two mirror operators. And what, it, what does the job is this relation. So there's a Mali, Mali, what's called Mali Okunkov R matrix that intertwines two different orderings of the mirror operators. So once I write down this mirror operator as R1 and R2, you, get, you can see that it, this really looks like a, a kind of young Baxter equation. But for that, our mirror operator has to be an R matrix. So um, I will answer this question in some ver in sort of version. Um, so I will not exactly add the answer that, 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 that the about the problem that I posed, but but uh, answer to the Q deformation of the problem, because uh, there's a way, there's a reason why I prefer this. Um, in, and there, there's an underlying twisted M theory background, and, and in this background, this Q deformation am amounts to change some uh, holomorphic surfaces to C star cross C star. So for the case of, cases of C cross C and C cross C star, there's many other works, um, and of course I borrowed a lot of intuitions, intuitions from these works. Um, so what's the twisted M theory? Uh, it's a M theory defined on this 11 dimensional background. It's topological along this seven dimensional model volume and holomorphic along these two holomorphic surfaces. I, I said it's C star cross C star. Uh, there's, a, there's an omega deformation that I didn't explain in very detail, but um, uh, it amounts to turning of potentials along uh, with respect to the rotations of these output planes. So effectively, the, the theory localizes to, you know, into this five dimensional wall volume. It's called 5D, 5D Simons theory. So we can put some M brains onto, onto this M theory, and there are M2 and M5 brains. M2 brains can wrap this R2, one of the R2, R2 planes and uh, wrap R, and M5 brains can wrap two R2 planes and a holomorphic curve. Uh, never mind about this PQ choices, uh, I'll only focus on the one comma zero. So uh, uh, namely, C one comma zero is a C star X plane. So these, uh, I, I, I show some possibilities of the M, M, M2 and M5 brains, and the, as you can see, in the 5D transimus theory, they engineer line defects or surface defects. So uh, the gate, they have to consistently couple to the 5D gauge theory, and the gauge invariance of the coupling requires the algebra of local operators on the defect, these defects to be representations of some quantum algebra. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the suggestion is that for our case of C star cross C star, it's a uh, quant quantum toroidal algebra. So in principle, I have to give you the definition of this quantum toroidal algebra by giving you the generating currents and the, and the relations. Let me not do that, but let me just deliver the notion that it's a certain Q1 deformation of what's called quantum torus algebra, simple, simple algebra uh, gener generated by X and Z with this relation. 
uh, and as you can see, Q1 and Q2 enter in an asymmetric way, but this full quantum toroidal algebra has triality of exchanging at Q1, Q2, and also Q3, which is Q1 inverse, Q2 inverse. Um, so for the M2 brain, uh, we uh, assign, what, what the algebra that's assigned is the quantum torus algebra itself. So uh, I express the same algebra, but, but now I explicitly write down this difference operator. Uh, I didn't tell you, but the uh, EFHs are the generating, um, um, ge generating modes of this quantum torus algebra, and they are mapped to the quantum torus algebra in this way. C and C perp are the center elements. For the single M5 brain, uh, we associate a free boson. So uh, the free boson is, the, is generated by the, these AR modes with these commutation relations. Um, EFK currents, generating currents, are uh, mapped to certain vertex operators. Um, so now what we can do is stack up this, stacking up these uh, defects. So uh, here I'm visualizing certain um, fusion of the line defects. So let's imagine you have uh, two parallel line defects, two, two line defects, then uh, they, can, you know, they can be fused into a single line defect. So it means that the local operators of the fused line defect can be built out of the local operators of the, these individual line defects. And algebraically, there's a, this quantum algebra algebra is, is a co-algebra. So uh, there's an operation uh, that preserves the algebra, algebra structure, and you, you can represent, represent on respective representations associated to this, this line defects to, to, get, um, to get a new uh, um, <clears throat> representation associated to the fused line defect. So uh, let, let me just mention that. Uh, so I, I started with a single line, single M2 brain. You can stack, up, stack them up, the parallel one. Uh, what you get is the, what's called the spherical double affine Hecke algebra. Uh, for the non-parallel case, uh, this is a new representation, and um, uh, I call it generalized Lucena Schneider representation because if I have one, only one set of x, x prime, x double prime, it will really become what's called the Lucena Schneider representation of quantum Fourier algebra. Uh, we can also, also play the same game for the uh, surface defects. So uh, on the surface defect, there are three bosons, and you can stack them up to form new algebras. For, so this, this, this case will be the what's called the QD-form W algebra. And, if I allow the most generic um, orientation, it will be what's called the Q-deformed Y algebra, which uh, David Gayoto and Miroslav Abshak studied. Um, so now, what's the mirror operator? So for the mirror operator, I consider the intersection between the M5 and M2. So, so it's the single M2 and single M5. Uh, at, the, at the intersection point, there's this red dot, there's a uh, there, there, there's a local operator supported, and, and uh, I call it R. So it has to be gauge. Sorry, it has to be has to be gauge invariant. And the, classically, the gauge invariant condi condition can be figured out by drawing a small sphere. And uh, uh, the gauge variation comes from its intersections with the with the defects. So there's a north pole, a south pole, and also there's a, a contour on the surface. Uh, so there's an ordering on the increasing R direction. So uh, the, the south pole contribution x from the right, uh, the north pole contribution of x from the left. And you might think there's a single contribution from the surface defect, but uh, it's important that the red dot is not the origin. So, um, so uh, when you do the mod expansion, you, you can decompose this contour into the two, dif two in independent contours that goes around this uh, zero. So you really have two contributions from the inward and the outward. So that's, that's a uh, gauge inverse condition in, in the classical level. It has to uplift to include the uh, uh, nonlinear contributions in the, at the quantum level, and then we postulate to uh, this to involve this co product too. Um, this relation doesn't come out out of nowhere. Uh, we know there's a notion of universal R matrix, and we, it, it can be exactly solved uh, to uh, to lead to to this uh, R matrix intertwining M2 and M5 representation. And um, by stack this M5 brain up, uh, the R matrix between uh, on the on, on uh, sorry on the right picture sh should be decomposed into products of this individual R matrices. That's the usual thing uh, in the co-product operations. Um, we can also exactly uh, figure out which screening charges uh, they are commuted with uh, by uh, using the M2 brains ending on the M5 brains, which I didn't have time too much time to talk. Uh, I was, there are also a relation with QQ characters, 3D half indices, and also there's a direct computation that you can do in the perturbation theory of the five digit Simon's theory. Uh, that's it, that's it, thank you. <coughs> we have time for a couple of questions. And do you have some impression of what's happened on the Poisson level and 
on the classical level? Uh, sorry, why is it classical? I, I didn't, why is it classical level? Quasi -classical your picture. Quasi-classical level, level meaning the... I mean the, this, uh, this mirror operators... Uh, so you, you want the, re yes, the want mirror to, operators I for the double go, algebra, go, not the All your cues go to what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so just take the limit of uh, that degener it's called degeneration limit. Just take the limit to this expression. We recover that differential e uh, operators in, instead of difference e operator. So uh, at the bottom line, you see this uh, uh, mirror operator expanded uh, in powers of difference operator, but that difference operator turns out to be differential operator in this limit. So you, you're, gonna, you're going to recover it. Oh, oh, sorry, uh, let me just mention one thing. So for the case of C equals three, you see this factor in the parentheses um, can vanish. That's very important. So that um, uh, only first two terms in the infinite summation can, can, can contribute in that case. That's why uh, mirror, mirror operator is very simple. Okay, thank you. I hope we can discuss later. Another question? I don't see any, so let's thank Sibyok for the nice talk. <laughs> Next speaker is uh, Elise Lepage from Berkeley. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to be talking about computations of homological link invariants from categories of A-brains. Um, so this is largely going to build on Mina's talk from yesterday, but I'm going to hopefully convey how we can explicitly calculate the link homology that Mina introduced yesterday, and I'm going to give a sketch of how we prove the invariants. So this is based on joint work with Mina and Miroslav Rapchek, and work to appear with Mina and Ivan Denilenko. Um, so, just to briefly review how we get the knot invariants that we want to calculate, is they're going to come from A-brains. So eventually we're going to choose um, a certain configuration of A-brains, and knot invariants are going to come from HOMs from one A-brain to another A-brain. And so in the specific A model we want to consider, um, the target space is going to be based on a choice of elite algebra. So it's going to be some number of symmetric products of an infinite cylinder, where the number of symmetric products we have comes from the number of roots of the Lie algebra. So we can think of this as the configuration space of colored points on an infinite cylinder, where each color corresponds to a different root of the Lie algebra. Um, and we're also going to add a potential. And so the role of the potential is just going to be that it equips the A-brains with a grading. So the resulting homology theory is going to have two gradings. It's going to have a homological grading, and it's going to have an additional grading coming from the potential that we call the equivariant grading. And so, for example, the potential is going to get, um, well, the grading is going to get contributions from monogamies around certain marked points. These are the points I drew as Xs. So these points are going to be labeled by weights of G. Or equivalently, we could say that they're labeled by highest weight representations of G. Um, and so then, in order to build knot invariants, we want to choose special A-brains, which I'll refer to as cups and caps, which you can imagine as like the top and bottom of braids. And so the way we do this is we want to choose a specific representation to color our knot. And so the cups and caps are going to categorify conformal blocks that represent the, this representation V and its dual representation fusing to the trivial representation. And so the way we do this is we choose a puncture labeled by highest weight representation V and its dual representation, and then we're gonna choose an A-brain that um, fuses these two punctures together. Um, and so we have to make certain choices of these parameters DA that depend on the representation we choose. So here I have a couple examples of what these look like for the case of SU4. And so I've drawn a Dinkin diagram on the far right to give you an idea of I want each root to correspond to a different color. So I can see here I have three roots. I've drawn them each as a different color. And so in the top picture, I have um, a representation with highest weight W1. It's going to be dual to the representation with highest weight W3. So it's the blue puncture and the green puncture fusing together to the identity. 
And then I choose um, the A brain is going to be the product of these three one dimensional surfaces. So this figure eight brain I've drawn in the top picture, I guess I can use the pointer. Um, this figure eight brain is going to be on the product of three cylinders is where it's living. And so I would say that this refers to the cup brain and then the straight line brain refers to the cap brain. And so what these three dots represent is just these three dots can be coordinates anywhere along this straight line with the restriction that the green dot is always on the same side of the orange dot and the orange dot's always on the same side of the blue dots. So the dots can't switch order. Um, then I have another example for this other rep of SU4 that's actually self-dual. So it's like the two orange punctures fusing together. And so then we actually want to build knots out of these cups and caps. And so the way we do this is from a presentation of a link as a braid closure. So I have an example shown here for the Hoff link. And so you can see the way I have my link presented, it starts with a pair of cups at the bottom. Um, so here I would say this is two cups. And then I braid the two middle strands. So it's like I'm braiding the two cups. And then I have the caps above this dashed line. Um, and so heuristically as A brains, I want to say the part above the dashed line corresponds to two sort of intervals. And then I have another pair of interval intervals for the part below the dashed line. And then I braid them. So I can see in my braid, I exchange the two middle strands twice. And so that corresponds to I exchange the two punctures twice. Um, and so then I want to translate this heuristic picture to actual A brains like I had on the previous slide. Um, so here's some examples it's for the fundamental rep of SU2 and for one of the SU4 reps I showed you. And so in order to get link homology, what I want to do is I want to take the space of Homs between the top brain and the bottom brain. So what you would actually do is they would be living in the same space. So you would overlay them and you would count their intersection points. These would be some perturbative ground states. And then you would want to calculate some corrections coming from holomorphic maps between the intersection points. And this in general is some very difficult geometric problem to count these holomorphic maps. But the premise of our work and what allows you to actually explicitly compute anything is that you can exchange this for an algebraic problem by writing down resolutions of these brains in terms of specific building block brains. Um, and so what this looks like is we have these specific brains that we call thimbles. And so these are these straight line brains. And so um, they sort of generate the category in the sense that I can build these more complicated figure eight brains as chain complexes built out of these straight line thimbles. And so here I can see that, um, so the way we want to build these is literally like geometrically. So you can imagine gluing these straight line thimbles along the dashed lines. So the dashed lines are going to be the maps between the thimbles. So you can imagine that if I literally glue them back up together, we recover this figure eight I've drawn. And then I can translate um, this geometric picture into a chain complex where the things I call T1, T2, and T3 are these straight line thimbles and then the maps between them are literally the maps of the chain complex. Um, and then the thing I have in curly brackets is the equivariant degree and there's a way to fix these. Um, so once I have this resolution, I want to compute the HOM to get a knot invariant. So this would just be the unknot because nothing's braided. Um, and so I can see here I have two intersection points. So I, I would expect Maybe there's a map, there's not in this case. So I just expect two intersection points and that's what I get. And the reason I get that is because um, this I brain is actually dual to the thimbles in the sense that the HOM from T2 to I2 is just Z and then the HOM from any other T brain to I is trivial. And so that just lets us very easily calculate the HOM from E2 to I2. And so the premise of what we do in our calculations is we are able to um, sort of take these figure eight brains, make a resolution based on geometry, and then just compute the HOM with the I brains and that will give us not homology. And so it turns out in the one dimensional case, this is very easy. 
Um, but in more complicated cases, we won't want to take the product of multiple brands and then we'll have to deform the differential in some way. Um, but this differential, we're able to make an onsets for it and completely solve everything using our code. Um, so I guess I can stop here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <laughs> Question from Greg upstairs. Yeah, you were talking about thimbles. I assume these are left shed thimbles for some super potential. Could you uh, ex uh, expl explain that a little bit? Yeah, they're, um, I guess they are lift shifts the most for the potential that I mentioned um, a couple slides ago. Um, I missed it. What was that potential? Oh, I didn't actually give the potential. I don't know if uh, I can. That's why I missed it. <laughs> go backwards. Yeah, I just sort of said, um, oh, here it is, yeah. I just mentioned that there is a potential. I didn't give its explicit form, um, but it basically has monogamy singularities at these marked points and also at the diagonal. So is it something like a sum of logs of yeah, differences of, log of, terms. of, of uh, points? Yeah, yeah. Like, like what appeared in Gaiato and Winton's paper discussion of knot invariance, where they had a they had a Lambda Ginsburg model where the superpotential was a, a sum of logs e i minus e j times. Yeah, yeah, it looks like okay. this. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, is it correct to uh, think of the links between two punctures as uh, a, a tangent component of the charles simon oscillation? Wait, could you say that louder? Is it correct to think of the uh, link between two punctures as the tangent component of the charles simon uh, uh, oscillations? I'm not sure. Talking about the, the uh, sigma, the... the uh, ch ch when I say ch tangent component, I'm talking about the coordinates in the string itself, in the uh, worksheet coordinates. Yeah, well, you want to think of these, um, they're coming from D brains, not from strings. The strings would contribute to like, the, like, the intersection points between the brains. Is that what you're asking? Maybe you can ask it again during the coffee yeah. break. I think we, yeah, we need to move on. So thank you very much again. Thank you. So the last speaker for this uh, session is Daniel Baldwin from uh, Kings on ICTP. It's about Coulomb and Higgs phases of G2 manifolds. Okay. okay, so thank you to all the organizers and for the opportunity to speak. Um, so I'm Daniel, based here at ICTP, and I'd like to talk about Coulomb and Higgs phases of G2 manifolds. So to start, I have a slide just going over the background of what is M-theory and why do we care about G2 manifolds. So M-theory is a candidate for a theory of quantum gravity, um, and all the 10D string theories arise as various limits of M-theory. Um, we know that at low energies, it's described by 11-dimensional supergravity. Um, and since it lives in 11 dimensions, to get 4D physics, we have to compactify the theory onto some uh, seven-dimensional compact manifold, uh, which I'll call X7. And then if X7 has a Ricci flat metric, uh, this space-time automatically solves the 11D uh, vacuum Einstein equations. And then we get some 4D physics from kaluza klein analysis of 11-dimensional supergravity. So what kind of manifolds can um, X7 be? Well, if we ask that we preserve N equals 1 supersymmetry in four dimensions, this forces the holonomy group of our 7D uh, manifold of the metric on R7D manifold to be um, the exceptional Lie group G2 by some general classification. And such manifolds are called G2 manifolds, and a nice thing about them is they're Ricci flat. So they're analogous to Calabi Yau's in string compactifications, but it's much harder to produce examples of them. Okay, so with the background done, now I want to speak about some work done regarding the physical interpretation of some particular kinds of G2 orbifolds that can be desingularized by a theorem of two mathematicians, Joyce and Karagiannis. And we'll see that different topologically distinct desingularizations of the same G2 orbifold that arise from their construction will correspond to Coulomb and Higgs branches of the moduli space of the arising uh, 4D supersymmetric gauge theory. And then we'll see that by studying the moduli space of these uh, gauge theories in more detail from differing viewpoints, 
will reveal an isomorphism between two uh, a priori unrelated moduli spaces. Uh, and all of this is joint work with Bobby Acharya. So now we just need to say something about ADE singularities and why they're important. So if we do the kaluza klein reduction of 11-dimensional supergravity onto a smooth G2 manifold, um, we don't get anything very interesting. So we only have abelian gauge symmetry and there's no possibility of having chiral fermions, which is bad because we need these for the standard model. And the solution is to let our G2 space develop uh, singularities. So it turns out that non-abelian gauge symmetry in four dimensions comes from co-dimension four ADE singularities uh, in our G2 orbifold, and chiral fermions come from co-dimension seven conical singularities. But I'll focus just on ADE. So an ADE singularity is of the form C2 quotiented by a finite subgroup of SU2. If we take M theory on an ADE singularity, in the 7D space-time, uh, the low-energy physics is described by 7D super Yang mills with gauge group GADE, where GADE is the group corresponding to the um, AD singularity by the McKay correspondence. Um, and inside of a G2 orbifold, AD singularities occur along three-dimensional submanifolds, which I'll call Q. And if we take M theory on some local model uh, of the form Q times an AD singularity, we'll get some 4D supersymmetric gauge theory arising from the reduction of the 7D super Yang mills onto this three manifold Q. But more generally, we'll be interested in G2 orbifolds with singular sets of the form Q times an AD singularity, all quotiented by some uh, finite group, which is freely acting um, on this Q, so we don't get any extra singularities. And it's known that the vacuum moduli space of the gauge theory arising from M theory compactification is given by the moduli space of flat complexified ADE connections on the three manifold Q mod K. And this space will generally be disconnected with many components. Uh, previous work looked at just the identity connected component, um, but we'll provide an interpretation for the other various components. So Joyce and Karajanis showed that if you have a G2 orbifold with a singular set of the form Q times an A1 singularity, quotiented by um, uh, Z2, so this is a special case of the above, then you can desingularize this to give a smooth G2 manifold if on the three manifold, Q mod Z2, there exists a harmonic and nowhere vanishing one form. So you remove the singular set and glue in some family of aguchi hansen spaces. Uh, and this all still works if this one form is replaced by a one form defined up to a sign locally on the three manifold, as long as it's harmonic and nowhere vanishing. So we'll call this a Z2 twisted one form. Uh, and this is the root of these topologically distinct desingularizations, which I mentioned. Um, when studying the physics, it will be natural for us to generalize to consider more diverse ADE singularities uh, and also higher order twists than what Joyce and Karajan has considered. And so the goal now is to physically interpret these uh, orbifolds and their various desingularizations. So as a simple example to illustrate all the results, we'll take our three manifold Q to just be the three torus, uh, times it by an AM minus one singularity and quotient by a freely acting Z2. Then we can see that on the three manifold T3 mod Z2, we have a harmonic one form and two Z2 twisted harmonic one forms. And they're all nowhere vanishing because they're constant in this uh, uh, example. Um, and so we're in the realm of this Joyce Karajanis theorem. And so following them, we should replace our singular set by T3 times N-centered Gibbons Hawking space, um, which is the desingularization of an AN minus one singularity, uh, with its hyperkähler metric, um, quotiented by some Z2. But the Z2 action on the Gibbons Hawking space isn't uniquely determined, uh, and there could be, ah, there could be um, many uh, different choices. Um, and these will lead to topologically distinct desingularizations, and therefore the physics we get in 4D will be different because we'll have different Betty numbers. So for example, if we take n equals two, we have two different desingularizations, x tilde c and x tilde h, um, and therefore we expect two different branches of our 4D gauge theory moduli space. Um, but we can actually study this moduli space explicitly from two different viewpoints. The first way is by studying the moduli space of Ritchie flat uh, special holonomy metrics on our um, spaces. Uh, and for the case of A-type A singularities, this turns out to be the same as the space of Z2 invariant configurations of n points in R3. So this is a simple space to consider. So if we take n to be two and choose our Z2 to act in the following way, we see there's two possible configurations of two points. Uh, so the first one we'll call the Higgs branch. It has two, uh, two parameters, 
the points are swapped into each other by the Z2. And then we have um, another branch, which we'll call the Coulomb branch, and it has a single parameter. On the other hand, it's known that the moduli space of M theory on um, this kind of orbifold is the space of flat complexified SU2 connections on the three manifold. And so we can also calculate this space, and we see again that there are uh, two possible solutions. The first one, again, we'll call the Coulomb branch. It's identity connected and has a single parameter. And the second one we'll call the Higgs branch, and it's non-identity connected with two parameters. Uh, and we also learned something about the 4D gauge group by taking the commutant of these flat connections in SU2. Um, so to summarize, we, we took M theory on this orbifold. We expected two different branches because there were two different topological desingularizations. Um, we then studied the moduli space from two different viewpoints and saw that indeed there were two different branches, one of them two-dimensional, one of them one-dimensional. And then we can also do uh, kaluza klein analysis to determine the 4D gauge theories on each branch. So on the Coulomb branch, we have N equals two SU2 CP Yang mills um, at the origin, which breaks to U1 away from the origin. And on the Higgs branch, we have N equals two SO2 CP Yang mills um, coupled to two hypers, and this is completely broken away from the origin. And also, if I can just quickly say, um, we can also extend all of the previous to all A-type and D-type singularities and deal with higher order twists. And in fact, for the A and D-type cases, um, we can completely determine the moduli space of flat connections on any flat compact three manifold just from considering the moduli space of Ritchie flat metrics. And so in our second paper, we show this explicitly. Um, so yeah, I'll leave that there. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks. I'm a bit puzzled. What does this have to do with G2? I think your Hohenheim is all sat inside SU3. Yeah, so this, this example was uh, quite special. So yeah, it was in SU3. That's why we got N equals 2, um, N equals 2 supersymmetry in our theories. But um, generally, these uh, will expect these orbifolds to be describing the singular sets of some genuinely G2. Um, yeah. I mean, if I, took the, if I was quotienting by Z2 times Z2 on the bottom, then I would have been in, S in G2, but not in SU3, and I would have had N equals one. Um, yeah, 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 we've um, we studied those. So in that case, we'd have three one-dimensional Higgs branches. Um, okay, one question here. Uh, so in the Coulomb branch, you see it's SU2 surpassing mu. So you, uh, so you mean you also specify the global form of the gauge group, or it's just the SU2 Lie algebra for the theory? Um, like, yeah, I, do I you guess. mean it's SU2 or it's SO3 or? Uh, yeah, the global form, I'm not, I'm not sure. I guess we're just saying... Okay, so it's just a, about the, the local information of the theory. It's just that tells you it's SU2, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. One more question here. It also seems to me that all this analysis was pretty local. I mean, you always hmm. take local. Is it possible, actually, in this Kovanov construction to take a further orbifold that you get Carroll matter? I'm not familiar with this. I mean, this is this twisted connected sum where you have two color yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, we, Be, yeah, we didn't... Because I don't understand how you embed that in a global uh, G2 manifold. Yeah, um, yeah, we didn't consider the twisted connected sums, but, like, there's some... I mean, the examples from... He made, he made Kovalev. Kovalev, <laughs> Kovalev yeah, okay. construction. Yeah, um, but, the, like, the examples of... Like, the first examples of Joyce, like these torus quotients, they all have singular sets with various components, and they're all of the form that we considered here. So we can just take each singular set gives us a um, factor of our gauge group, and then um, we get the matter representations by seeing how the adjoint decomposes into this uh, group. Um. Any urgent last question? Otherwise, let's thank Daniel and all the speak speakers collectively for very nice presentations. So we break for coffee and we're back here, I think, at 4.20. Oh, 4.30, so we have 10 extra minutes. 4.30.